Hello everyone, and welcome back to Fantasy Friday. So we are very nearly finished reading The Tiger and the Wolf. We have only a few chapters remaining. So we're going to go ahead and dive straight into it here with chapters 45 and 46. For a brief recap, we saw Manny and her band move towards the sacred place of the Boar tribe. And then, just as we left off, Asmander and Shiri noticed that the wolf and the tiger were both encroaching on that territory. Now, Manny and Hesperic are trying to do some sort of ritual, and everyone else is kind of there just to protect them, essentially, because the wolf and the tiger both want to get at Manny, of course. So let's see how that works out for them in chapter 45. Manny and Hesperic sat in the shadow of the stones in this spirit-heavy place, with a fire burning between them and with Asmander's glyph-carved pebbles arranged between the bases of the monoliths, the standing one and the two fallen. Hesperic had covered Manny's hair with a shawl of bright dyed horse linen. She had mixed up an ink of charcoal and water and had dabbed it on Manny's face, tracing the dotted path of coils there, making them sisters, light and dark. And Manny told herself that she could feel the hill shift and shudder minutely beneath her as the serpent rose within the earth, summoned from its unthinkably distant southern haunts, from its running places alongside the warm river. For the coils of the serpent ran everywhere. Had she not felt its presence and seen its rainbow scales in dreams? She might dare to hope so, if it would help her now. You and I, we will go on a journey, Hesper told her softly. Manny was aware of her other friends moving, spreading out around the hilltop, sudden tension in them. As though she was truly connected via the coils in the earth, she knew that accurate Stone River was nearby, and that Jolpe, the Tiger Queen, was close. The jaws that had been gaping for so long were preparing to snap shut, and she was where the teeth would meet. There is a landscape known only to the wisest, the serpent girl whispered, in whose number, of course, I count myself. Her voice was slow and rhythmic, becoming almost hypnotic. It is not a land of rivers and marshes, or of deserts and plains, or even of cold northern mountains and the jagged teeth of broken rocks. It is a landscape of gods. That is where we must travel to petition for your soul. And the yowling of the tiger cried out its warning from the trees, chilling Manny's blood. She shivered and made as if to jump, but Hesperic reached about the fire and caught her wrist. You must listen to nothing and nobody save for me. If our friends fail, then we will be caught and killed here, because our own minds will be far away, gone in a direction that nobody else can ever follow. Our souls will be with the gods, and whether that is a good thing or a bad depends on how you comport yourself before them. So you must attend to me, or you will be lost, understand? Manny nodded. Hesperic's eyes flicked sideways. The stone place would have been better, she sighed. Two or three could have stood off an army on that causeway. Here, well, we are sheltered. And the hill is steep. Perhaps our handful will keep them back for long enough. There were raised voices now, the sound of men working themselves up for the fight, swearing the oaths and boasts that prefigured bloodletting. Manny forced the sounds from her head and looked straight into Hesperic's copper eyes. Now I will tell you something of this land we must travel to, and thus you will see it in your mind and let it become real to you, and this shall become our steed to take us there. The serpent priestess was still gripping her hand. Are you ready to see your gods for what they truly are? Matt and Yoff were very still, very focused. There was none of the running about and yapping that might have been expected of them. Their master was going to war, and they understood it. Their eyes were pinned on the enemy down below. Loud Thunder wore his stinking armor of grease-hardened hides, surely enough to deter the noses of any number of wolves. His great axe, with its weighty copper head, rested over his shoulder as he peered down at the winter runners. Beside him, Broken Axe seemed a frail figure, even with an iron hatchet in his hand. 
Down there, they look like little ants, the big man grunted. I think they won't look much bigger when they get here, eh? Broken Axe could not raise a smile. The wolf pack was at the tree line, scaling the hill, ignoring the twisting path and scrabbling directly up the steep side, using human hands and feet. It was heavy going for them, especially those wearing coats of iron. Loud Thunder looked around speculatively, hauled up a decent-sized stone in both hands, and bounced it down the hillside with a roar. The wolves scattered to either side of it, but when they started up again, their ascent was slower, and they spread themselves out more. Another few stones failed to hit any of them, and then they were passed halfway up, whereupon Stone River halted and shaded his eyes, looking up at them. Broken axe! I see you there! he called out, and one by one the other wolves paused, waiting. They were just outside the distance where they might have rushed the two defenders. It needs no good eyes for that, Axe replied, still weighing his hatchet in his hand. Shatter's Oak is dead! I saw it, Broken Axe conceded. It was she who wanted your blood. I have claim to it, for you've betrayed me and the wolf. I'll let you go, and your fat friend too. Stone River told him. You are not why I'm here. I can forget the bad blood between us. You've made a mistake. All men make mistakes. Wise men seek to amend them. I did make a mistake, Broken Axe admitted. Go then. Mend that error of yours. The girl is nothing to you. That's not the mistake I meant. Broken Axe took a deep breath. My mistake was not calling you out ten years ago and more. How far have you chased just to catch one frightened girl, Stone River? We both know you have no claim on her. Yet, because she has defied you, you cannot walk away. That is your mistake, not mine. My mistake was turning my back on the man you became back in the war. The war with the tiger, the chief of the Winter Runners echoed. You don't remember how it truly was. I remember enough, Broken Axe replied harshly. Now come, if you're coming, or go. He was almost too slow. He had been focused too much on Stone River, but a handful of the wolves on either side had been inching up from the hillside, drawing slowly nearer. Only Loud Thunder's roar saved him as the cave dweller stepped, bulking out into a bear that seemed to blot out the sun. Then there were three warriors clamoring for him, fighting to get close enough to step and close the last of the distance on Wolf Paws. Manayi was in a shadowed land of undulating hills that fell away in every direction she looked. Above her was the night sky, but the constellations were not those she recognized. Instead, the stars drifted past one another, hunting the sky for... She could not say what for, but there was something threatening about those mobile motes of gleaming light. She was terribly afraid that they were hunting for a way in. This is the god's land, came Hesperic's soft voice. This is the secret known only to my people and some few others. This is what we saved. Saved? From your oldest kingdom? Manny asked. Before that, even, we took this into our hearts and carried it away from the lands we had lost to the plague people, and then we burned all the land behind us so that they could not follow, and the sea rushed in to fill it. This is the land of souls, many, many tracks. When we die, this is where our souls return, and once they depart to be born again. This is the heart of our dream. Many knew she still sat atop the hill, with the three stones about her. She knew that what she saw was built from her own imagination and Hesperk's hypnotic voice. And yet, with her eyes closed, she saw it. It was as real to her as the world of grass and trees and the sun with which she had left behind. You are not alone, Hesperk told her, and she realized it was true. Close beside her was a shadow standing under that restless dark sky. Eyes like green gems regarded her imperiously, and fire rippled down the great beast's flanks in shimmering stripes. A tiger. The tiger. 
The suggestions, the mere shadows and breath she had seen within the shining halls, were nothing to it. Seeing the beast before her, standing so close, she could barely breathe. Its scale and magnificence exerted a pressure in her mind. Away from it, a thousand half-seen reflections seemed to recede in all directions, mirror tigers, each one of them less and less like the original, as it fell further away. It regarded her imperiously, and distantly she heard Hesperick ask her what she saw, and her own voice stammer out an answer. Look beyond! Find another hilltop! What do you see? To think was to move her gaze, to look was to travel. The hilly land was crowded, she now saw. Every hilltop had its master, surrounded by myriad shades of itself. From the feet of the tiger, now she found herself before the wolf, a stare composed of moon-silver pinned her, crouched almost between its paws. The gape of its teeth could have swallowed the sun. Good, came Hesperick's dry tone in her ear. But tell me, what lies beyond and between? Whose domain is nearby? You must know, Manny said. I cannot know. The serpent's lair is far from there. You have gone to your own place in the god's land. I may not travel there. Manny, listen to me. Because you saved my life not once, but twice, I will tell you the secret of the world. I will tell you what no other priest or chief or sorcerer would wish you to learn. It is power, this knowledge, if only you can use it. But then again, all knowledge is power, if it is not wasted. So tell me. What do you see near the wolf? Turn your back on him and search the nearest hills. Uh, I, I see, Annie stammered. There was a lean, half-starved shape looking back at her from the next peak, like wolf's thin shadow. There is Coyote there. Of course, Coyote that would be. Coyote would be wolf if he could, Hesper confirmed, amused. But further, look further. I see... Manny stammered again. There was an animal beyond, something like a big-eared dog with a spotted hide, but quite unlike the creature that Shiri stepped to. Manny described it uncertainly, but it seemed to make sense to Hesperick. That is the hunting dog of the plains, Hesperick said. His people were wolf tribe once, before they were driven south. Find yourself at the feet of the tiger once more. Surely there will be something there. She sought out the tiger, thinking that it must be on the next hill, or the next. But, when she found it, she had lost the wolf, skipping over a vast gulf that lay between them. The hillsides about the tiger were strewn with other cats, large and small. She saw Lion watching her with haughty stare, and the sly, cruel smile of Jaguar, and others still, but none to her purpose, not even the great sword-toothed cat that was the lion's champion. Where is the creature Asmander steps to? Where is his killing claw? She demanded. You must know the path that leads there. No, 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 Hesper broke in. That is not the way of the god's land. Open your mind to me and hear my words. The god's land is the land of the possible. It is the landscape of every animal that is and ever was, perhaps every beast that there could be. Travel from the tiger, and you shall reach first those beasts that are its brothers and sisters and cousins. Travel on from them, and you find totems like them, but less like tiger, you see. So, travel the land between tiger and wolf, and tell me what you find. Surely there is some unknown shape lurking there that will be your champion. And Manny walked that land, hill to hill to hill, and she saw cat-likes and wolf-likes, and many shapes in between that were like nothing she knew. But many of them were small, more hunters of mice than of men. There were no giants, no savage killers that she could find, and between the two halves of her being was the great yawning darkness, where she could find nothing at all. Asmander crouched atop the boulder-strewn side of the hill. He could hear the voices of Axe and Stone River shouting at each other. Perhaps that was the tradition in the crown of the world, before a formal fight. He'd heard the same went for the plains. 
Perhaps you should insult them, he suggested. Shiri shrugged. She had pulled out some armor of layered linen, which had been folded almost flat inside her pack, but now hung on her in starched panels, a cuirass and plates hanging down to her knees. To his eyes, it made her seem younger and more fragile. Insult who? she asked. Asmander had been noticing shifting movement at the tree line for a while, and, even as he opened his mouth, he heard the calls of the great cats to one another. He narrowed his eyes, watching for that first move, wondering if he would leap down amongst them, or if he would let them come to him. Then Shiri yelled a cackling battle cry, and dropped past him with her axe descending. He heard the furious snarl of a tiger from right beneath his feet, and realized the enemy were already upon him, that the Shadow Eaters had ghosted right up to the stones without him seeing. He did not hesitate, jumping down from the boulders and stepping halfway, so that what landed before a startled tiger warrior was the champion, rattling its quills and shrieking like death. His opponent was a man, a cat, then a man again, thrusting at him with a spear, but Asmander leapt at him, springing high over the lunge and coming down across its shaft, shattering the weapon and knocking its wielder to the ground. There were more coming at him already, just flurries of movement in his peripheral vision, so he kicked the disarmed spearman hard in the stomach, catching him just as the man stepped to his tiger shape and bowling the striped cat down the hill. Shiri had her bone-crushing teeth about a tiger's foreleg, shaking her spotted head back and forth as it raked its other claws down her side. Then both of them had stepped away, the plains woman's axe sweeping past the northern warrior's face as the, as the tiger retreated, ruined arm held close. Another woman came for Shiri with fluid movements like dancing water, cutting at her with the curved bronze edge of a knife. The laughing woman skidded away, losing a foot of hillside, but then stepped and went for the throat, teeth snapping just short of her target before finding herself facing off against a tiger considerably bigger than she was. Asmander was about to go to her aid when he saw that one of the tigers had gained the top of the rocks, with nothing between her and their quarry but a jump down. With a hiss of anger, he took three quick steps and leapt, clearing the vertical distance in a single bound and landing off-balance beside his enemy. She flinched away, but a moment later she was on him, claws hooking at his hide and her jaws gaping wide. She was going for his throat, but all she managed was to graze the flesh over one shoulder before he sank his own teeth into her. She stepped, using the shifting of shapes to twist from between his jaws. This was the tiger priestess who had led the hunt against them the time before. Then she had got her knife into him, just a glancing line of pain down his ribs. In an instant, he had followed her, striking down with the stone points of the makan. She swayed out of the way of the blow, sliding to one side in a move that put the point of her blade at his gut. Striking down, he caught her forearm with the heel of his off hand, ramming the pommel of her weapon into her leg and trapping her arm against her own body. Before he could use the leverage, she had pushed a hand into his face, almost toppling him from the rock. She was a tiger in the next instant, and he was the champion again. Shiri was facing three, two big cats keeping her at bay, and a man beyond them with a fistful of javelins. They had all dropped some way down the hill, closer to the tree line. The priestess swatted at him a couple of times with a paw, trying to put him off balance, but suddenly he had no time to fight properly. He struck out with his feet, not trying for a disemboweling stroke with his claws, but simply kicking the tiger hard under the ribs, spilling her from atop the rock and hopefully winding her. Then he had leapt out into space. He let his mind fall into the champion's well of calm, reaching out for a feeling, a way of experiencing the world. The breath leapt in his lungs. His great leathery wings caught the air and he shrieked for the sheer joy of it, the hideous cry of the shape that Hesperk had sent against the eerie men. He dropped onto the tigers like a monster from the old stories, and they scattered, darting back for the trees. Back to the rocks, Shiri yelled. There might have been some gratitude in her eyes, but there was no time for it to form proper words. A moment later, and they were both stepped and running again. There was a cry from Manayi. He heard it directly, not of shock or pain, but a wail of lament. For a terrible moment, Asmander thought that Hesperk must be hurt. Even as they scaled to the base of the rocks, though, he heard the serpent priestess's voice calling out. Laughing girl, come here now! 
Shiri, human once more, met Asmander's lizard eyes. That's not a good plan, she declared. Asmander forced himself back to humanity. Though the champion resisted him, knowing bloodshed was coming and wanting its share. You must go, he got out. But the serpent calls, and you must go. That is how it is. For you, maybe. Shiri, please. She looked frightened, but not for herself. Fearing what his own face might show in answer to that, he let the champion take hold of him again, assuming his post atop the rocks once more, watching Shiri wave her way around to reach the others. The tiger were coming out from the trees again, only a handful, but there was only one of him. And so concludes chapter 45 of The Tiger and the Wolf. So we're right into the thick of the battle. We have Broken Axe and Loud Thunder facing off against Acrid Stone River and the Wolves. We have Shiri and Asmander facing off against the Tiger. And then we have Hesperic and Manny facing off against the Dream World, this alternate world where Manny is searching for the champion, if one exists, of the Tiger and the Wolf. So, let's see how things play out in chapter 46. Broken Axe was swift as man or wolf. He danced and darted, and yet never fell back. The blows of his enemies cut through the air past him, and the iron edge of his hatchet was quick to respond. Stone River watched one of the younger hunters try him, darting in on four feet, all snarls and defiance. Broken Axe met the youth in the same shape, twisting aside from his teeth to worry viciously at the back of the boy's neck, flipping him over and sending him rolling down the hill. His next assailant got close and then stepped to human, bringing the grey edge of a knife towards Broken Axe's gut. Nimble as a warrior half his age, Axe got his shoulder beneath the upward-cutting blow and guided the attacker's knife hand away. His own weapon lashed in, not a killing strike, but a powerful blow with the flat to his opponent's temple. Stone River's warrior collapsed to the ground, stunned or worse, while Broken Axe still stood. And no wonder, for he was fighting in the shadow of the largest cave dweller that Akrit had ever seen. The huge bear had not shifted an inch since the skirmish began. Three wolves had gone up against him, with spears and axes and fangs, but all of them had fallen back limping and mauled. Arrows and throw darts had not even penetrated the monstrous creature's hide. At the bear's feet were two dogs fighting with the coordination of warriors, lunging out from behind their master's ankles to snap and bark and growl, a constant threat and distraction to any enemy that might dare come close. On open ground, the entire pack could have descended on them, surrounded them and dragged them down, even the bear. With the tumbled stones lending them a hard flank, the wolves could not concentrate their numbers to finish the fight. Broken Axe stood in the bear's shadow, and to enter the bear's shadow meant broken bones. Stone River had hesitated on seeing that great mass of muscle and hair and claws blocking the way. He was not reckless. He wanted his followers to wear the monster down first, though there was precious little sign of that happening as yet. Bear killer! He snapped, and one of his warriors handed him the weapon. It was a favorite of the wolves, long hafted with an inward curving iron blade honed to a razor edge and terminating with a piercing point like a beak. The horse called it a falx, but the wolves knew it as the bear killer, and killing a bear was what Akrit needed to accomplish. But now it was the turn of smiles without teeth, and if Akrit's most faithful follower was smaller than the bear, still he was the strongest of the winter runners. He loped up the slope with another couple of hunters to back him, stopping outside the bear's reach to survey his enemy. Arms spread wide, the cave dweller reared up on his hind legs and bellowed, and smiles seized his moment to dart in. He stepped as he came close, dropping down to one knee and striking in with his axe, with the other two wolves right behind him. Broken axe was there too, though, lunging forwards even as Smiles' blow went swinging in. Their hafts locked together, deflecting Smiles' stroke up and away, but, for a second, Broken axe was left exposed to the next hunter in. Acrid hissed in triumph, envisaging the death stroke before it happened. 
The dogs got in the way, though, snapping and leaping at the hunter so that he flinched away, striking too late. The wolf's knife ripped into the side of one of the dogs, opening the wretched creature up. It was a meager victory, but Akrit heard his follower cry out in triumph nonetheless. It was the last sound he made, though, for then the bear saw what he had done. With a roar of fury, the cave-dweller came down on him, all his awful weight concentrated in his forepaws, splintering the man's bones like kindling. It will be me, then, Akrit thought. He hefted the bear-killer in one hand, then stepped and was heading up the hill at a run. Before him, he saw Smiles Without Teeth step and go for the bear's legs with his teeth, forgetting that there was a human mind behind that mountain of animal power. The cave-dweller stepped to meet him, kicking him in the stomach hard enough to bowl him over, then swinging furiously with that great axe of his. The blow had been meant for Smiles, but the other hunter got in the way as he lunged at Broken Axe with a spear, not paying attention to anything else. The dweller's axe head caught him across the shoulder and chest, shattering his arm and spinning him away. Then Smiles was back. His iron coat had kept him from any real harm, just a solid bruise where the bigger man had kicked him. He had his axe upraised, ready to bring it down with all the power both mighty arms could manage. He had always sought to win his battles with strength, had Smiles without teeth, and amongst the winter runners it had sufficed. The cave-dweller stepped back into his bear shape and slapped a claw-studded paw with crushing force against Smiles' strike. The blow hooked the wolf off his feet, hurling him away with the bear's vast strength and sending him through the air like a stone, end over end. Just as the ground fell away from the hilltop, so Smiles Without Teeth seemed to fall away from the ground, falling upwards until the world remembered him and brought him down. From that impact, iron could not save him. Stone River spared a, grief, a brief second's regret for the death of his friend, but then he was standing before the bear himself, and that became all of his world. Broken Axe had recognized him and was trying to close, but another pair of young wolf hunters was at his heels, diverting the trader's attention as they snapped at him. The cave dweller's paws came thundering down, the huge beast truly fighting mad now. Stone River pushed himself aside, scrabbling against the slope of the hill, feeling the breath of that near mass twitching the hairs of his pelt. Then he was a man again, the bear killer blade of his falc sweeping in, too close and too soon, so that the beak point barely grazed his foe's back, and the cutting edge glanced off that thick hide. Then the bear was a man once more, towering over Stone River still, swinging the axe down in a wide arc. Akrit stepped to slip beneath that swing, got his teeth briefly into the bear's unprotected shin, then backed off. To lock his jaws would be to fix himself where his enemy could find him. The copper axe swung down again, its great weight of metal swooping through the air swift as a bird. Stone River tried to twist aside again, but the other dog was in his way, and the two of them went down in a snarling tangle of limbs. Furious and desperate, Stone River gripped at one of the animal's forelegs, taking a great bloody gash there. He knew the axe would be coming for him again, so he darted before the cave-dweller, under the swing, stepping as he came round. He had wolf speed in a man's shape just in that moment, and he threw it all into the strike, the arc of the falcs cleaving the cave-dweller in the hip. The cutting edge was foiled by the larded goat fleeces the big man wore, but the point dug in deep, not a killing wound, but a slowing one. His enemy stepped again, seeking the greater mass of the bear shape to protect him. Akrit was ready for him to rear up in anger and expose his belly. Instead, the cave dweller stayed low, swiping at his tormentor and baring his great yellow teeth. Akrit could see his path clearly now. He had fought men and he had fought tigers, yes, and other wolves, and once or twice he had fought bears, though none as massive as this. He swung again, making a great show of the powerful two-handed blow, and the bear, with its man's mind, swatted the falcs away. Akrit took the force of that blow, but he took it as a gift, spinning the weapon about at its balance point, so that it came in twice as fast from the other side. On all fours, the bear had only one paw at a time to act with, already overextended from its first parry. Akrit put all his strength into that blow. Had a man ever before killed a bear this size with a single stroke? Perhaps he would be the first. 
He felt the clean bite of the blade as it chopped the beast's hide and slammed deep into the flesh beneath. He had been aiming for the neck, but his enemy's movements or the fickle ground had left the weapon deep in the bear's shoulder and back, and tip surely in amongst the creature's ribs. The cave dweller roared again, but Akrit heard more pain than anger now, a desolate, terrible sound. The beast reared up, and if Akrit had not been ready, he would have lost his weapon. As it was, the bear's own motion ripped the falcs out of his flesh, releasing a gout of blood that painted the rocks around them. For a heartbeat, Akrit stood in the bear's shadow, falcs already arcing inwards again, and braced for the crushing impact of those claws. Then the cave-dweller dropped back onto all fours again, with a whimper, and the falx's course raked across his muzzle. Stone River would have finished it, if not for the dog. The beast was at him without warning, leaping up to his chest, teeth hungry for his throat. Akrit stepped, took the animal by the scruff of its neck, and simply flung it away. He was already flinching from the bear's expected retaliation as he turned back, but the cave-dweller was shambling backwards, lurching and limping. Instead, before him stood Broken Axe. Go! the traitor shouted to his injured friend. Stone River found himself grinning because he had defeated the bear, because he was about to kill Broken Axe, and after that he would have one of his people open his daughter's throat, and then none amongst the winter runners would ever doubt his strength. And Broken Axe's eyes passed from Stone River to the eleven wolves who could still fight, and he nodded philosophically. So be it, he said. I call you out, Stone River. I challenge you. Akrit shook his head. We will tear you apart, traitor. Who is the traitor? Broken Axe called out. Here we stand, two men born of the Winter Runners, and which has betrayed his people. What are my wrongs? That I have gone my own way, and helped a girl who chose to do the same? And what do you suggest are mine? Akrit knew he should just strike, but he wanted Broken Axe to know that he was wrong before he died. You have placed yourself above the wolf, Broken Axe declared, and loud enough for all to hear. You have followed a dream where the crown of the world was in your shadow, and you have ever sought to make it real. You sought to rule. To rule in the wolf's name, Akrit snapped feeling the tension stretch the moment until surely the pack would flow past him to bring Broken Axe down for his killing stroke. In your name, in your name, you have shed blood at the stone place. In your own name, you have sought to dig up the war with the tiger. You have ever sought to be a taller man than you are, and, to do so, you have piled up the bodies of others. That is not the wolf's shadow you cast. It is your own. Bring him down, Akrit snapped. The tide of grey bodies, they milled and moved about, but did not advance. Those in wolf shape whined and kept their heads low, and the men would not meet his eyes, if Smiles without teeth had been there to set an example. But Smiles was dead. You are not fit, Broken Axe said, each word heavy as a stone. I challenge you. For the leadership of the Winter Runners, I challenge you. Many kept searching from hill to hill, and yet, whenever she turned back, there was the wolf or the tiger, the twin poles between which her life was strung, picked out by the light of an unseen moon. Between them, the landscape of gods and monsters was shrouded by eternal night, denied to her. If Hesperic spoke the truth, here was the country that stretched from wolf to eagle, from tiger to serpent, to Asmander's swift lizard. In that dark there were great beasts of time and legend waiting to gift her with their souls. She felt she was tethered, even as her father had once leashed her. Her realm was just a small circle of light in that great midnight landscape. She could not break free from her heritage, and within her she could feel her souls uncoiling, pressing against the walls of their prison. This was their place, far more than it was hers. Here was where their strength arose from. Here they were stronger than she was. Once that understanding filtered through to them, she would not be able to keep them tied within her. They would break free from her, break away from her, and then... And then there was noise and shouting, 
all too close, intruding from the world outside so that she lost her image of the god's land, lost that sense of the great spirit standing close by. The wheeling stars drew together to become the fire, and she jerked away from it, feeling the ground tremble as though the whole hill was stirring. But it was not the hill. It was loud thunder. The huge man sat slumped by the fire, his skin and the fleece of his armor glistening with his own blood. His face was clenched up like a fist, but when he met her eyes, he still tried to smile. He's a fast one, your father, he murmured, just a rumbling in his chest. And my mother will not be pleased with me. Manayi leapt up and went over to him, but the sheer scale of his body and his wounds dumbfounded her. She did not know what could possibly be done. It was like trying to heal the land itself. Back to the fire, Hesperic yelled at her. Manayi, we'll have no other chance than this. You have to find the god's land again. But he's hurt, Manayi said. So obvious a statement, and yet, what else could she say? Hesperic shook her head frantically. If not now, then you're lost. Manny, please. That shadow landscape was still there in the back of Manny's mind, and yet Loud Thunder was right here, with Yoff whining and sniffing at him, the dog as helpless in his misery as she was, and she sensed the vast breadth of the god's land. For a moment, she was falling back into it as both her souls tore at her, Vast and without boundaries, the tether fraying that had kept her at the feet of her totems. Her legs lost their strength, and she collapsed, nodding her hands in Loud Thunder's goat hides. Hesperic was still calling her name, but when she tried to find the Serpent Priestess, all she saw were those stars, that land. I, I, I see, she got out. I, I am there, and I... She was moving away from the wolf, crossing towards the tiger passing through the valleys of wolfkin, moving into the fiefdoms beyond. There was the vast shadow of the bear, a hill atop a hill. She could see all the shapes in between, the succession of beasts that she could pass through, in order to turn a wolf into a bear, a bear into a wolf, a wolf into a tiger. "'You must go on without me,' came Hesperic's whispered voice. "'But I understand now. I will help you.' I will help Loud Thunder, too, if he can be helped. Trust me. Find your new totem. And then, from a greater distance still, the distantly heard summons of the Serpent Girl. Laughing Girl, come here now! Can I choose the bear as my champion? Manny thought. But she knew she could not, for it had its people already, living and dying and being reborn, animal to human human to animal, in a constant round. She must find some great warrior spirit in the space of bear and wolf and tiger that would make her its avatar. And she searched and she searched, and the tether was back, its cord stretched longer, and yet still she was leashed. And what time was there if loud thunder had been taken from the fight? And the world opened up for her. Perhaps there was a tether still that would have kept her from the lands under the eagle's wings, or the lazy shadow river where old crocodile basked. But, abruptly, she was let loose into the land beyond, a land of a thousand thousand god-spirits, each one showing its claws and sharp fangs to her. She was in the great empire of the killers, where, before, she had been bound to the little village domains of a mere handful. The profusion of shapes about her bewildered her. There were shadows of beasts that never were, or were no more. There were bears greater than the bear, wolves that doubled and redoubled the wolf. There were cats that overshadowed the tiger, with teeth longer than falx blades. And there were hyenas as great as horses, gathered next to Shiri's spotted and high-shouldered laughing god. As Mander watched the tiger's approach, sliding in shadow up the hillside, he had stepped to his human shape and calmed his breathing, feeling the familiar grip of the Makan in his hands. As they picked up speed, closing the distance, he rediscovered his winged soul, spreading his great veins so that he became the cloud that blotted out the sun, his shadow like an eclipse, screaming at them in his hoarse, harsh voice. And then there was the champion, crouching atop the rocks, exuding its invincible confidence, master of all the killers of the earth. 
and they slowed, not one of them wanting to be the first. And, when they had slowed enough, they stopped. Probably they thought they were still too far off for him to pounce on them, though they were wrong. There were some javelins hurled then. He danced aside from two of them. Then one came in that was sent high, enough to land close to where Hesperk was. And so Asmander sprang up, stepping to catch it in human hands and cast it back, then landing back on the champion's scythe-clawed feet. His return throw had been wild and awkward, but he had still made an impression. Then one of them was suddenly human, a stern and handsome woman armored in bronze plates, an axe in one hand and a knife in the other. She had about her a sense of command, and before that solemn gaze, Asmander regretted his showmanship and stepped so that he could hear her with human ears. I am come for my daughter, the tiger queen told him. Asmander made an awkward face. I know that! Why stand in my way, black man? Why do you harm my people? What is this to you? It's complicated, he admitted, keeping a narrow eye on where those people of hers might be fanning out to. I don't care for your daughter. I would throw her to you myself. But she is beloved of one I respect, so I am here. In the tiger's face, he thought he saw a spark of pride that, even in defiance, her daughter had found strong allies. What she said finally, though, was, I am not afraid of you. Take as many shapes as a sorcerer, and I am still not afraid of you. It was not what he had expected from her. It was not what her followers had expected either, to judge by the sudden uncertainty amongst them. Asmander racked his brains to remember what he knew of the woman. What had Manny said? You have heard of the wolves' howl he observed. They are come for her, too. There was a flinch in response, though the woman covered it well. Then stand aside so that we may take the girl before they do, or would you fight us on their behalf? Asmander grimaced. Not any more. I do not fear the wolf, she spat at him, though he heard the hurt in her voice. I would hunt Stone River for you if I could, he decided, for surely that would be the correct action. But what little honor I have left is committed to another service. So fight me, Queen of Tigers. I shall come down to you. He relinquished his greatest advantage, just slipping to the ground rather than leaping down amongst them. The tigers were still bunched uncertainly there, held back by what they were hearing and seeing. He had them spellbound and their queen gestured them away. I am not afraid of you, she repeated. I do not want you to be, he confirmed. I want you to fight me. That is what I am meant for. I have tried other purposes in my life. I have proven ill-suited for them. He got a smile from her then, just a faint one, but it was well worth the effort. Then she was before him, settling into a fighting stance with the ease of long practice, knife held low, axe across her body. He followed suit, McCann sloping at his shoulder, his right foot back, knees a little bent. He had the reach, but she struck as he tried to use it, her axe hooking his weapon away, and then the dagger darting in. He gave ground, back and sideways, trying to use her own hold on the axe haft to drag her off balance. She was a step ahead, though, the knife still driving for him, persistent as an angry bee. He swept a foot towards her legs, forcing her to step away, and followed up with a strike cleaving at where her neck and shoulder met, moving to complement the McCann's weight and balance. She passed through those movements of the duel as perfectly as a dancer, eyes always on his face, matching aggression with aggression, yet calm as still water. He could not land a blow on her. It was an admission of defeat of sorts, but he was the first to step. He took the champion's shape, leaping abruptly so as to come down on her with his talons. Instantly, she was a tiger ducking beneath him, so that, when he landed, she was almost behind him, a woman once more and her axe hacking towards his neck. He was a crocodile then, belly to the earth and lunging forwards with open jaws. She vaulted him, came down on his back as a tiger with her claws drawn in. She lost her grip a moment later, the champion kicking her off and pursuing. 
He took a rake across his flank, and another along his snout. For a moment he had her, the deep bite of his jaws fixed at her neck, his clawed hands hooked into her striped hide. There was bronze beneath that fire and shadow fur, though, and then she was a human woman twisting from his grip, her knife drawing a shallow line across his leg. The champion loved her, as Mander could feel. Not he himself, not his human heart, but the champion was smitten. It wanted to kill and devour her, but it was love nonetheless. Then the rest of the tigers were there. In that moment, when she had been within his jaws, their loyalty had overcome their honor, and they rushed forth. Abruptly, he was surrounded. Their queen stepped back, face a mask of frustration and anger, but she did not call them off. He fought. Of course he fought. The champion gutted one with a rip of his claws. Old crocodile's jaws closed on the leg of another, as his armored back shrugged off the blow of a stone-studded club. He spread leather wings and cowed them in his shadow, forced them to fall back. Then Arachaka tackled him from behind, wrestling and reaching until she had his throat gripped in her arms, bearing down his suddenly human body as another fought his hand, contending for a hold on the Makan. And right in the heat of battle, that is where we finish chapter number 46. So, pretty intense. Two solid chapters of just all-out bloody war. Wow. Unfortunately, Loud Thunder sustained some severe injuries, and he is out of the battle. Of course, we never had Venet, uh, formerly Venator, uh, because he was freed by Asmander sometime earlier. And now Asmander is completely surrounded because all the tiger decided to swarm him. Uh, Shiri is apparently not there, or otherwise preoccupied. And Hesperk is coming, but Hesperk is just not much of a fighter. She can't really do anything. So, yeah, we're, we're in a bit of a pickle here. So make sure to tune in next week as we read the next two chapters and find out what is going to happen to Manny and her band of company. So... Until then, I hope you have a wonderful weekend. Bye now.